رمضانيا خير الشهور يا فضل رحمن غفور السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم We have been discussing the life of Hazrat Yusuf alayhi salam and we had mentioned how Hazrat Yusuf alayhi salatu was salam uh, was falsely accused of a crime of a sin that he had not committed <coughs> and how the wife of Aziz Fotifar whose name was Zulaikha she uh, told Hazrat Yusuf alayhi salam and so did her friends that if Yusuf alayhi salam did not cave in to Zulaikha's uh, advances if he did not given to her advances then she would have hazrat yusuf al islam imprisoned we will continue this story from here on <clears throat> now that more and more people were talking about his wife aziz fotifar decided to imprison yusuf al islam to save his own family's honor Aziz thought that if he detained Yusuf alayhi salam people might think that Yusuf was guilty instead of his wife Zulaikha However Aziz knew that Yusuf alayhi salam was innocent so after sending him to prison he put Yusuf in charge of all the other prisoners This prison was located in one portion of Aziz's house By this time Hazrat Yusuf alayhi salam had been appointed a prophet by Allah almighty so he devoted his time in prison to worshiping Allah and preaching to other people with time people realized that Yusuf alayhi salam was a righteous servant of Allah and not the criminal he was thought to be all the prisoners began to respect him and would come to him seeking answers to their questions about God people would often go to him and mention their dreams that they had seen and yusuf alayhi salam would tell them what their dreams meant one day two young men were brought into that prison one of them was the chief royal baker who used to bake food for the pharaoh the other prisoner was the chief royal cupbearer and his job was to serve wine to the pharaoh king It just so happened that both men had been committed had committed or done something to make the pharaoh unhappy and angry with them therefore as a punishment pharaoh sent them both to the prison where yusuf alayhi salam happened to be imprisoned as well both men came to yusuf alayhi salam one day mentioned their dreams to him and requested him to tell them what their dreams actually meant this tells us that dreams are not to be taken literally they mean something else and you need someone with certain expertise in this field to interpret what those dreams actually mean it's not that if i see a dream and right away i say okay well this is what i saw then this is what it means when a uh, when a person sees a dream then that dream is to be interpreted and usually it's not any tom dick and harry who can just get up one day and say okay this is the interpretation often times the people who are interpreting the dream are those people who are called awliya allah there are certain sifat attributes that are supposed to be in them that makes them eligible to interpret somebody's dream the sign given to yusuf alayhi salam what was the miracle given to yusuf alayhi salam his miracle his sign was that he could interpret dreams so this isn't something very little or very small that anyone who sees a dream says oh well i saw this this is what it means one of the person says 
I see in my dream that I am pressing wine, said the chief royal cupbearer. The chief royal baker then said, I saw myself in a dream carrying upon my head pieces of bread which the birds are eating. Tell us what these dreams mean, said both men to Yusuf. Yusuf Islam said, Before you are served your food in prison today, I will inform you of what your dreams mean. But before Yusuf Islam told these men the true meaning of their dreams, he preached to them about believing in Allah Almighty. Now, this incident shows us that the way of the prophets has been that they preach first and then they serve the meal or then the food is served. Remember at the time of Holy Prophet wasallam, he invited his family members, extended family members over for a dawat and he served them food and then when he stood up to say something to them, they left. So the next time, Holy Prophet <coughs> invited them again. But this time, instead of serving food first, he preached to them and served the food later. So based on this, we should also adopt the same methodology that when we have guests and we have to serve them food, first serve them the spiritual food, then serve them the physical food. <coughs> Moving forward, Yusuf Islam said to them, Before you are served your food in prison today, I will inform you of what your dreams mean. But before Yusuf Islam told these men the true meaning of their dreams, he preached to them about believing in Allah Almighty. Yusuf told them, I have given up on the religion of the people who do not believe in Allah and who disbelieve in the life after death. And I follow the religion of my forefathers, Hazrat Ibrahim, Hazrat Ishaq, and Hazrat Yaqub, alayhim salam. We should not commit shirk. This is the favor of Allah upon us all. But people are ungrateful to him. O oh, my two companions of the prison, are different lords better or Allah the one, the most supreme? What you worship besides Allah are just names that you and your forefathers have made up. Allah has commanded that you worship no one besides Him. This is the right religion, but most people do not know it. What's the lesson in this point? The lesson is that it's very important to follow the right religion of Allah. It's very important to worship Allah Almighty the way He wants us to worship Him. And we follow the religion that He wants us to follow. This is kernel to spirituality. You know when a sniper aims at a target and then shoots at the target and if a slight jolt happens or the wind is not properly calculated or taken into consideration and even if it is 0 0.1 centimeter of difference what that difference will do is that ultimately, larger the distance it is, it is going to miss the mark by a greater, by a greater mark, actually. <coughs> we have, you know, many... What can I say? Shikari is sitting here. Many hunters are sitting here. And they can attest to what I'm saying. That if you shoot at a target, but you miss even by a slight centimeter if you did not you know take uh, the wind into consideration and other factors by the time your bullet hits the target it's gonna miss by god knows by how much of a mark this is called law of nature now law of nature is not that different from the law of religion law of sharia so when a slight change occurs in Akida, you'll end up missing the mark. It's common sense. It's basic logic. And Allah Ta'ala says that, look, law of nature is my work and the law of Sharia is my word. And my word and my actions cannot go against one another. So this is why it's very important 
that we follow the right religion. This is the same point that I had mentioned a few days ago, that it's important to understand this because spirituality comes from Allah. Now, if somebody worships idols and does it wholeheartedly, can we say that that person can be spiritually uplifted by Allah Almighty? Can become a muttaqi, muttaqi or a waliullah? As long as that individual is worshipping the idols. It's not possible. It's not possible not because I am saying it's not possible. It's not possible, possible because Allah Ta'ala says it is not possible. Allah Ta'ala, if anybody reads the Holy Quran with a neutral frame of mind, They'll see so many places where Allah Ta'ala says that people who worship the idols, people who create these false images that they worship or false gods or false deities or false ideologies, their deeds, good deeds will be rewarded in this life. Yes, if an atheist does something good, they'll get the reward in this life. But Allah Ta'ala also says in the Holy Quran, they will not have any reward in the afterlife. If a person with the wrong Akida does something good in this life, they'll get the reward for it because that is also according to the law of Allah Ta'ala. Allah Ta'ala says in the Holy Quran, لَيْسَ لِلْإِنسَانِ إِلَّا مَا سَعَى Anyone who works or strives for something, they'll get the reward for it. But then Allah Ta'ala says, the Akhirah, the reward of the Akhirah is for the believers. Now who decides who a true believer is? Do I decide or does Allah Ta'ala decide? Allah Ta'ala decides. And who does Allah Ta'ala inform? Allah Ta'ala informs his prophets, his khulafa. So this is why this lesson which we are drawing from the story of Hazrat Yusuf al-Islam, it's very important that we understand this. Moving forward, afterward, Yusuf al-Islam told them both the meanings of their respective dreams. To the cupbearer, Yusuf al-Islam said that he would be released from prison serve wine to the pharaoh and be in his good graces again and as for the chief baker he would be crucified and birds will eat the flesh from his head allah told yusuf that the pharaoh had decided to move forward with this decision soon after the royal cupbearer was released while the royal chief baker was killed by crucifixion just as yusuf had said <coughs> Yusuf al-Islam requested the royal cupbearer to mention Yusuf to the pharaoh when he was freed from prison and was back in the good graces of the pharaoh. You must wonder why Yusuf would ask the royal cupbearer to mention him to the pharaoh. Yusuf al-Islam felt that as soon as the pharaoh hears about him, how righteous he was and how he could interpret dreams, the pharaoh would investigate his case. And realize that Yusuf was actually innocent and will then set him free from prison. But Allah tells us in the Holy Quran that the royal cupbearer forgot to mention the name of Yusuf in front of the king because he was too busy serving wine to the king and his people, along with engaging in other immoral acts. There is another important lesson coming up. You see, drinking alcohol and working in places where alcohol drinks or alcoholic drinks are served can make a person forget Allah Almighty and doing other good deeds. Another reason why Yusuf Alaihissalam remained in prison for so long was that instead of relying on the help of Allah alone, he asked the cupbearer to mention him before the Pharaoh. Had Yusuf Alaihissalam relied solely upon the help of Allah Almighty, he would have had him come out of prison much sooner. Meaning Allah would have had Yusuf Alaihissalam come out of prison much sooner if Yusuf Alaihissalam had relied on Allah completely. Because of these reasons, Yusuf Alaihissalam remained in prison for the next 12 long years. 12 long years. The plan of Allah was set in motion and after 12 long years, the time was right for Hazrat Yusuf to be freed. 
Allah Almighty made this happen by showing the Pharaoh a bizarre dream. Now here is the mention of a second dream. The Pharaoh came to his royal court and summoned all the viziers and priests. He then told them what he saw in the dream last night. I see seven fat cows that seven skinny cows are eating up and seven green ears of corn and seven others withered. The Pharaoh said, O oh, chiefs, explain to me the meaning of my dream if you can understand dreams. They replied, These are confused dreams, O oh, Pharaoh king, and we do not know the interpretation of these confused dreams. You see, no one in the court of Pharaoh knew how to interpret dreams. Thus, they just made excuses and said to the Pharaoh that your dreams are the problem. They don't mean anything. It is just a confusing dream that you have seen. When no one there could tell the Pharaoh the meaning of his dream, his cupbearer, who was there and used to be in prison with Yusuf, remembered him. At that moment, he requested that he be allowed to go on leave and that when he returned, he would be able to tell the Pharaoh what his dream meant. With Pharaoh's permission, he rushed and came straight to the prison where Yusuf was a prisoner. He met Yusuf told him about the dream and requested its true meaning so he could go back and inform the Pharaoh. Yusuf based on the knowledge given to him by Allah, told the cupbearer about the true meaning of the dream. You shall grow wheat and corn for seven years by working hard and continuously. You must save most of the corn or most of the corn crop and store it and you may eat the rest. After this, seven hard years of no rain shall come meaning no new crops will grow. The people will survive on the seven years of saved corn crops. Then there shall come a year after which people shall be relieved. So a roadmap of events that were going to take place over the course of next 15 years was being laid out by Hazrat Yusuf or by Allah Ta'ala through this dream that Yusuf was interpreting. After receiving the true meaning of Pharaoh's dream, the cupbearer returned to him and told him the interpretation of his dream. The Pharaoh was amazed at the great understanding of his dream. You can imagine how furious the other viziers in the court of Pharaoh must have been after listening to the interpretation since they could not interpret the Pharaoh's dream. Remember what I mentioned? In order to interpret dreams, you need to be a spiritual individual. Not any Tom, Dick and Harry can just stand up and say, I will interpret what this dream means. <clears throat> Pharaoh realized that Yusuf was not ordinary, but a man of many great talents. Therefore, he sent his royal messenger to go and bring Yusuf from the prison to the royal court. But when the royal messenger came to him, Yusuf refused to go with him. He told the royal messenger first, go and tell the Pharaoh to inquire about the women who cut their hands and fingers. Surely my Allah knows what they did. The royal messenger returned to the Pharaoh and informed him that Yusuf was not willing to leave the prison until the false allegation against him was properly investigated. The reason for doing this was to prove to the Pharaoh and other people that Yusuf had not done anything wrong and was in prison under false claims. Had Yusuf left the prison without his name cleared, the Pharaoh and other people would have thought that God forbid, maybe, just maybe, Yusuf did commit the sin he was being accused of. Still to show mercy, Pharaoh was releasing him from prison. Yusuf did not want to leave the prison without having his name cleared first. Therefore, he made this specific request to the Pharaoh to investigate the matter by directly asking the friends of Zulaikha. Zulaikha was the wife of Aziz Fotifar. Upon hearing this, Pharaoh sent for Zulaikha 
and her friends to appear before him in the court. When they arrived, the Pharaoh addressed the women by saying, What was the reason that made you try to seduce Yusuf against his will? The women were scared and told Pharaoh and the entire court the truth. They said, He kept away from sin for fear of Allah. We have known no evil against him, they continued. Zulaikha, standing not too far from her friends, spoke up out of fear that the Pharaoh of fear that the Pharaoh would severely punish her if she remained silent even now. So she said, Now that the truth has come to light, I sought to seduce him against his will. Indeed he is truthful. Now everyone knew that Yusuf was innocent. The Pharaoh sent his royal messenger again to Yusuf Now he finally agreed to leave the prison upon learning that his name and reputation had finally been cleared of all false charges that were leveled against him. He traveled with the royal messenger to appear before the Pharaoh. After arriving in the royal court, Yusuf told the Pharaoh and others present that he had asked for this investigation to be made so that his master Aziz Fotifar may know that he was not dishonest and did not commit any sins behind his back. Aziz Fotifar knew that Yusuf did not commit the sin, but it seems that Aziz Fotifar might have suspected that it could have been Yusuf who might have spread the word out about Zulaikha. Either way, Yusuf had this investigation made or requested so that when his name is cleared, Aziz Fotifar knows that Yusuf was not the one to be blamed here at all. Pharaoh told Aziz, You did not recognize the true worth of such a brilliant man as Yusuf, but I know his worth and I will honor him greatly. The Pharaoh asked to speak to Hazrat Yusuf privately and told him, From today onwards, you are a man of position and trust with us. Pharaoh wanted to appoint Yusuf to the powerful office of the Prime Minister of the entire land of Egypt. Think about this for a second. From prison straight to Prime Ministership. Allah Almighty told Yusuf that the Pharaoh would appoint him to a high office, but that the most appropriate office for Yusuf at this point would be to govern the National Treasury. The Treasury oversees the wealth of Egypt and its agricultural growth. Some people here raise this allegation. They say that Yusuf asked for an Oda. Yusuf did not ask for an Oda. He was told by Allah Ta'ala that Pharaoh is going to give him a higher office and it is better for him to request Pharaoh to not give him that office but give him a different office for which Allah will directly help Yusuf to execute the responsibilities of that office related to finance. The reason why people raise this allegation is because sometimes people ask for Oda. People ask for a certain office and they say that we should be given this responsibility because we are worthy of it or we have such social standing in the Jamaat or elsewhere that we should be honored with a responsibility, we should be honored with an Oda or a title. Such individuals forget what Rasulullah has said. Holy Prophet has said an individual who asks us for an office shall not be given an office whatsoever. وہ بندہ یا وہ بندی جو یہ ایکسپیکٹ کرتے ہیں کہ ان کو عوضہ دیا جائے ان کو ہرگز عوضہ نہیں دیا جانا چاہیے یہ آن حضور صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم کا فرما ہے Moving forward The Treasury Department oversaw the wealth of Egypt and its agricultural growth Therefore Yusuf alayhi salam said to the Pharaoh Appoint me over treasures of the land for I am a good keeper and I have the right knowledge for this job. Hence the Pharaoh listened to Yusuf and appointed him as the treasurer. This way, 
Yusuf al-Islam ensured that none of his enemies in Pharaoh's court could ever stop his work of protecting and managing the crops for the next 14 crucial years. As every prophet practiced marrying and having children, the Pharaoh found a suitable match for Hazrat Yusuf and married him to a noble lady named Asinat, who bore him two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. Pharaoh told Yusuf al-Islam to take charge of the treasury right away. So Yusuf al-Islam started to travel throughout the country to ensure that different seeds of crops were sown correctly into the earth and appropriate measures were taken to water and harvest in time for what was to come. For the first seven years, there was plenty of rain causing the river Nile to provide water to the fields throughout through a sophisticated system of canals and as a result the harvest was highly fruitful for the first seven years. The Egyptians were very happy and were told that if they only kept what they needed and deposited the surplus with the treasury then at the time of drought the treasury would take care of their needs. A detailed record of people Depositing their surplus grains was kept along with the census records of how many people were living in Egypt at the time to manage this entirely or this entire operation efficiently. You see, individual people could not protect their crops for years on. Only Yusuf Islam could masterfully do this in the entire country as he was chosen and taught by Allah Almighty. <clears throat> how to manage this task. Based on the interpretation of the Pharaoh's dream, Yusuf Islam made sure that the people used only the bare minimum of grains while most of the grains were stored for later consumption when the years of drought began. Several measures were put in place by Yusuf Islam to store surplus grains. First, he traveled throughout Egypt to designate cities where surplus grains could be stored. He then had huge silos built in these cities where grains of crops would be stored. Amazingly, some of these silos built during the time of Yusuf al-Islam have recently been unearthed in the ancient city of Tal Adfu in Egypt. This is just one of the many cities where silos were built under the direct supervision of Hazrat Yusuf The wheat and corn grains as were shown in the dream were left untouched and because the grains were covered by leaves, the ears of the plant that is, this ensured that insects or mice would not <coughs> eat the actual grains. The ears are also protected from rain or storms so the grains would not be ruined. The huge silos where the grains were stored were tall and wide buildings with many doors. The doors were closed at all times except when the crops were needed to provide food to the people of Egypt. There were openings on top of these silos from where the workers would pour in the grains of crops by climbing the staircase. After the grains had been stored, the openings on top of the silos would be closed up again. As time passed, these silos became filled to the top with grains and there was now a considerable supply of grain to feed the entire population of the country of Egypt. This was nothing short of a miracle. No one had seen or anticipated anything like this before. Now that the seven years of plenty were ending, the seven years of drought were about to begin. Egyptians had stored enough grains to sustain themselves and help other people from the neighboring <coughs> lands who were also struck by the drought. With Hazrat Yusuf al-Islam in charge of the treasury, expertly controlling the distribution of the grains, he showed his compassion for fellow human beings in need. This example of Yusuf al-Islam shows us that compassion and empathy should not be limited to our fellow citizens or relatives. Instead, they should be for everyone. The word quickly spread 
that Egypt had silos filled with stored grains that they had harvested during the seven years of plenty and that these stores were controlled by a man with genuine compassion who was willing to help anyone in need of grain. Eventually, the people of Canaan also found out and those in need began to travel to Egypt in small caravans seeking grain. It had been almost 40 years since Yusuf had been taken away from his beloved father, Hazrat <coughs> Yaqub And throughout this time, Yaqub had not given up hope of being reunited with his son and both father and son prayed continuously to be together once again. Now the sands of time had shifted and it was time to finally bring Yusuf face to face with his ten half-brothers who had once <coughs> abandoned him and then sold him into slavery. One day in the second year of the drought, a small caravan arrived from Canaan. This journey must have taken several days, if not weeks, as the distance is several hundreds of miles. This caravan included the ten older brothers of Yusuf, who arrived on camels along with other men from their village. They all entered from the same city gate and came face to face with Yusuf unexpectedly. Yusuf <coughs> recognized his brothers, but since they did not expect Yusuf to have survived or become so successful in life, they failed to recognize him. Even though Yusuf had recognized his brothers, he did not say anything harsh to them, nor did he disclose to them that he was their younger brother, whom they had betrayed several years ago. On the contrary, he treated them with respect and hosted them personally. Yusuf also gave them plenty of bags filled with grain which would last them for several months. While speaking to his brothers, Yusuf inquired from them about who else lives with them. They told him their elderly father, one of their mothers, and their youngest brother lived with them. The youngest brother they were speaking of was none other than the younger brother of Yusuf Hazrat Binyamin. Thus, Yusuf used this opportunity and told his half-brothers, Bring me your other brother whom you did not bring this time. Do you not see that I give you the full measure of the grain and that I am the best of hosts? But if you do not bring him to me, said Yusuf with a stern voice, then there shall be no grain for you, nor shall you have any access to me. Yusuf also instructed one of the servants to put their money back in their saddlebags so that when the half-brothers of Yusuf go back and open their saddlebags and they see their money returned to them, they'll want to come back again. You see, it was a huge honor to be close to Yusuf who was the head of the treasury of the entire land of Egypt. Yusuf had power given to him by the Pharaoh, making him the most influential person in the country, second only to Pharaoh himself. So naturally, the brothers of Yusuf wanted not only to come back to get the sacks of grain, but also to have a direct line of access to Yusuf, the head of the treasury of Egypt. In the hopes that Yusuf would also help them in the future, they all decided to convince their father, Yaqub to allow Binyamin to travel to Egypt with them. The last time the brothers had asked Yaqub to permit them to take their younger brother Yusuf, they had almost killed him, ultimately sold him into slavery and then lied to their father about what had happened. Yaqub was naturally unwilling to let his youngest son Binyamin go with his other sons. The hesitancy of Yaqub to let his youngest son travel with his older ten sons was not misplaced since his older sons could not be trusted. Upon their return to Canaan, one of the sons of Yaqub approached him and said, O oh, our dear father, we will not be able to receive any more grain in future from Egypt 
Unless you send our brother Binyamin with us, we will surely protect him, they added. Yaqub was not happy at all with this suggestion. He said to them, I cannot trust you with him as I trusted you with his brother Yusuf before. While hearing this, the brothers opened their saddle bags and found their money returned to them, which they had used to buy the grains. They were delighted and said to their father, O oh, our dear father, what more can we desire? Look, here is our money returned to us. They said, We shall bring more provision for our family and protect our brother, and by doing so, we shall have extra grain that an extra camel can carry. I will not send him with you, said Yaqub until you give me a solemn promise in the name of Allah that you will surely bring him back to me, he said. Upon hearing this, the most respected among the brothers named Yehuda promised, promised on behalf of everyone and assured Yaqub that come what may, our dear father, I would bring Binyamin back. I would bring Binyamin back to you. Eventually, Yaqub permitted his sons to take their youngest brother Binyamin along. One of the older sons of Yaqub also informed him that the last time they had gone to Egypt, they were asked many questions by the treasurer of Egypt. For example, he asked who they were, where they had come from, who else lived with them in their household. The brothers told Yusuf how many family members they had, and then he specifically asked for Binyamin to be brought to him the next time they came to Egypt. He further stated that perhaps we were thought of as spies. And since the treasurer of Egypt wanted to make sure that we were not lying like spies often do, he wanted us to bring Binyamin along with us. Sensing that something was not right, Yaqub told his sons that when they go to Egypt this time, they must not enter the city from the same gate, but rather all of them should enter separately from different gates. But you see, there was another reason why Yaqub wanted all his sons to enter the city in Egypt from different gates. It was because Allah Almighty told him that Yusuf was still alive and was in Egypt. If all the sons entered Egypt, Entrance, if all the sons entered the city separately from different entrances, maybe, just maybe, Binyamin might reach his brother Yusuf without his half-brothers ever knowing about it. Yaqub then privately shared the news with his son Binyamin that Yusuf is alive in Egypt and perhaps the treasurer in Egypt is none other than your brother Yusuf. Therefore, when these 11 brothers traveled to Egypt, this is precisely what they did. They traveled from Canaan riding their camels and entered, and entered the central city through separate gates. When Binyamin entered the city gate separately from his brothers, Yusuf <coughs> recognized him quickly, took him inside his chamber and told him that he was indeed Yusuf, his older brother. Binyamin told Yusuf about their father Yaqub which brought much happiness to Yusuf both Binyamin, but Binyamin also told him how poorly the older brothers had treated him since Yusuf was taken away several years ago. Upon hearing this, Yusuf told him, do not be sad at what they had been doing to you all this time. You are safe now. While Yusuf hosted all his brothers again, he treated Binyamin with special love and care. The servants on duty around Yusuf all noticed how he would treat Binyamin. Even the other brothers were shocked to see how much Yusuf favored Binyamin over everyone around him. When it was time for the caravan to return, Yusuf put his cup from which he used to drink water in the saddlebag of his brother Binyamin. He did this so that later when Binyamin would get thirsty, and open a saddlebag, he would find this cup of Yusuf in his bag. He would think of his brother. But while talking to Binyamin, Yusuf accidentally put the royal measuring cup in Binyamin's bag as well. Yusuf used this measuring cup to measure the grains before putting them in the saddlebags of the visitors. It was given to him by the Pharaoh himself. 
and it was priceless. A few moments later, the caravan was getting ready to leave when the royal servants noticed that the expensive measuring cup of the king was missing. The only people near the area where this cup had last been seen were the brothers of Yusuf a.s. The servants called out to them and said, You are thieves and have stolen the royal measuring cup. The head of these servants said, I promise that whoever brings this measuring cup to me will be given a camel load of grain as a prize. The brothers answered, By Allah, you know well that we did not come here to act unjustly and we are not the thieves. <coughs> and the punishment for him in whose bag the measuring cup be found shall be the penalty for it, they said. Meaning, whoever had stolen the cup should be taken as a prisoner as a punishment for this crime. The royal servants started searching the bags of all the caravan members. They did not search Benjamin's bag because they had seen how kind and living Yusuf was towards him. However, when the bag was not found in anyone's bag, the servants at last came to Benjamin and searched his saddle bag. The measuring cup of the king was found in his bag. And because the brothers themselves had said that whoever had the cup would be taken as a prisoner as punishment, Benjamin now had to stay back in Egypt. The brothers out of frustration said to Yusuf if Benjamin had stolen, then surely his brother Yusuf had also stolen some things before as well. They wanted to show the rest were not like Benjamin or his brother Yusuf. Unbeknownst to them, the person that they were saying these things to was Yusuf himself. Since they did not know that they were speaking to Yusuf, they just lied in front of him and everyone else, thinking no one would suspect their lie. Instead of telling them that they were lying, Yusuf simply said to them, Allah knows best what you allege. This means that only Allah knows if what you say is true or false. Sadr Sahib, how much time is left? Okay. They requested Yusuf to keep one of them as a prisoner instead of Binyamin because their father Yaqub is old. I cannot keep anyone other than the one in whose saddlebag the measuring cup was found, Yusuf replied. The law in Egypt was that no visitor could be kept behind or imprisoned without a reasonable cause, and thus Yusuf salam, despite wanting to, could not keep his brother Binyamin with him. Therefore, Allah Almighty granted this wish for Yusuf salam, so Binyamin got to stay behind with him. Initially, the brothers kept requesting Yusuf salam, to let Binyamin go and instead let one of them be taken as a prisoner. But when they saw that Yusuf would not listen to them, Yehuda, the same brother who had earlier promised Yaqub that he would bring Binyamin back, said, I could not go back without Binyamin. Therefore, he said he would stay behind until their father granted him permission or Allah made a way out for him and Binyamin to return safely to Canaan. The other brothers then had to return to Canaan without Yehuda and without Binyamin. The example of Yusuf following the law of the land shows us that when we live in a country, we must follow its rules unless the laws are against the teachings of Allah. In that case, we should migrate away from that country instead of, instead of breaking its laws. Similarly, when Holy Prophet Muhammad lived in Mecca, he followed the local laws as best as possible. But when the Meccans started forcing him to act against the teachings of Allah, he migrated to the city of Medina. Another lesson, another important lesson for all of us. If following the rules and the laws of a country are so important, shouldn't following the rules and laws of Allah be more important than that? Which begs this next question, that when we follow the laws of a country, to the T, but when it comes to following the teachings and the laws of Allah Ta'ala, we start finding excuses <coughs> and reasons 
that this doesn't make sense or why are we asked to follow this? So food for thought for all of us to think that when laws of the country, when following the laws of the country are important, we should give more importance to the laws made by Allah Ta'ala. Muhammadur Rasulullah